And uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Shishant Dr. Gupta. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Gupta as uh, today's speaker. Uh, he's a very well-known theoretical physicist in the non-equilibrium and mesoscopic physics community with approximately 200 research articles and several books. Uh, besides doing research, uh, he was heavily involved as an administrator in developing several world-class science institutions in India, as for example, the School of Physical Sciences of Jawaharlal Nehru University as its dean, the physics department of the SN Bose National Center for Basic Sciences as the director. He was the founding director of the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Kolkata. This is the place from where I obtained my uh, integrated MS degree. Uh, in fact, Professor Dr. Gupta was my uh, MS thesis advisor. Uh, before stepping back from all the busy administrative commitments, he also served as the vice chancellor of the Vishwavarati University. Uh, these days, he is uh, really enjoying uh, doing fundamental physics research as an honorary INSA professor. Uh, he received uh, several important awards for both his uh, scientific achievements and his uh, administrative contributions. On a personal note, I would like to mention that it's Professor Dr. Gupta's course on statistical mechanics uh, that got me started in the field of open quantum systems. Now, with this introduction, I would ask the audience to welcome Professor Dr. Gupta to the online Zoom podium, and the floor is yours, sir. Can I start now? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Aniket for your kind introduction. I would also like to thank IBS, PCS for their warm invitation to give this seminar. Uh, I would go straight to the lecture and then of course, uh, I hope that it will be an interactive session with so many uh, advanced research scholars present here. Uh, so, so here's the title of the talk, Spin Boson Model for Nonlinear Optical Conductivity of Graphene. So the central theme is the material called graphene and how uh, it responds to uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation in terms of an oscillating electric field. And we look at nonlinear, that is going beyond the usual linear response regime of the kind of Kubo response into nonlinear regimes, which is warranted by the situation at hand, which I will discuss in detail. And to analyze the effects, we will introduce a spin boson model. So let me just switch off the video for better connectivity now. All right. So maybe next slide, please. On, yeah. So here is the, uh, fine. Uh, well, you have all seen the abstract, so I shan't really read it now, but just to mention that graphene is a wonder laboratory, is a system with remarkable properties and applications. So maybe next one, please. Aniket, next slide, yeah. So I'll start with some references, just to give you an idea of where the talk is going to be focused on to. Uh, well, there's a, there's an excellent review paper in Reviews of Modern Physics by Castroneto et al. The Electronic Properties of Graphene, which gives you a glimpse of the fundamentals of graphene, which this audience must be very familiar with. There's also a, a nice field, quantum field theoretic uh, analysis of the physics of graphene by my friend Baskaran which is in a modern physics letter. My talk will be mostly based on a paper, which is number four, which we uh, published in 2021 in PhysRev B. But prior to that and around that time, um, I also wrote two pedagogical articles for university students uh, in, in a journal called Resonance of the Indian Academy of Science, which is titled, Carbon Hybridization to Tight Binding to Dirac Solid, the Wonder Laboratory of Graphene. And, uh, and an interesting title that you may like, which is the next one, Can Graphene Be Used to Teach Quantum Mechanics, which is in current science. The idea is that much of 
the preliminary facts about graphene are actually based on both non-relativistic and relativistic quantum mechanics that we teach as our first courses in, in uh, undergraduate curriculum. And so it is, uh, graphene can be used as a prototype model to in fact teach many concepts of quantum mechanics, which I will quickly summarize in the beginning. Uh, the not dissipative, the dissipative idea, that is the non-equilibrium ideas and what you need to do in terms of the theory, uh, they are based on uh, a book that I wrote some uh, almost 20 years ago with my uh, Delhi colleague Sanjay Puri called Dissipative Phenomena in Condensed Matter in Springer for that. And then uh, going a little deeper into various relaxation mechanisms in graphene as uh, as an offshoot of our earlier FISREB 2021 paper, uh, a, a young PhD student, Brishti Ghosh, in Bhubaneshwar, in one of the IITs with her supervisor, Molloy Bandhupadhyay, have done a more detailed microscopic analysis of the relaxation characteristics in nonlinear optical conductivity. And uh, if I have time, I would certainly like to discuss that a little more. Okay, next Can slide. Can you switch on the video? Switch so it on, uh, Amnon? Yes, hi. Can you switch yeah. on the video so we can see? Yes, open? I can. I was asked by Oniket to switch it off to get better connectivity, but now I can I'm Good. switched it on. <laughs> Great to see you, Amnon. Yeah, me too. You too. Good. Aniket. Okay. Now, this is something that you all know. I, I won't go over any detail of this. It's It has graphene has remarkable properties. It's an allotrope of carbon in the structure of a single layer of carbon atoms, each on the vertex of a hexagonal lattice, which is a honeycomb lattice. And it is blessed with some extraordinary properties. So, next slide, please. All right, as I said, it's a graphene is a single layer of graphite. It's a thinnest two dimensional material. It's 97% transparent and it is conducting. Next slide, please. Now this is very basic chemistry. This is actually taught. In fact, I have taught these things even high school chemistry students. Uh, and this is part of their quantum chemistry curriculum. So you start with carbon and you realize that carbon has six electrons. Out of these six electrons, two are in the lowest one state and they are of not any consequence for us because they are so deep inside and they're interlocked with to opposite spins in the one state, which Pauli principle will allow. So we shan't consider them anymore because they don't take part in any solid state properties. Then we are left with four more electrons and they go into the two S and two P states. One normally would think that one could put two electrons in the two S state and then two more in the two P state. However, there is something called promotion, which even uh, an undergraduate uh, textbook, uh, the famous one being Atkins, which talks about it is called promotion in order that you can minimize the Coulomb repulsion, you can promote one of the two S electrons into the two P state. This is called promotion. And so now we have a situation in which we have one two S electron, two 2p electrons in the px and py orbitals and how we choose the xy directions actually are quite arbitrary to begin with. But lo and behold, you'll later see that this xy directions of the hybridized 2s, 2p orbitals in fact define the structure of graphene when you bring two carbon atoms together. This is a quite a remarkable thing that quantum chemistry is dictating the lattice structure. So now, therefore, we have a situation which is shown on the right-hand side. You have one 2s electrons, 
and two 2p two electrons of orbitals px and py types, they hybridize and they form a butterfly with symmetry. The butterfly wings are oriented with respect to each other by 120 degrees. And remember this, because that is going to mean that these orbitals are going to be on the vertices of an equilateral triangle when we form a lattice. That leaves one lone electron, the PZ electron, which is normal to the XY plane as is shown on the top. And that PZ electron is in fact responsible for all the conduction properties, all the solid state properties, because it keeps hopping from one lattice site to another. We will indicate that. So just to summarize, the two, one 2s electron and one and two 2p electrons hybridize into a butterfly structure. That is going to give you the lattice structure of graphene, a hexagonal lattice built with interpenetrating equilateral triangles. Therefore, it's called a honeycomb. And then you have a lone PZ electron, which, keep, which is a mobile electron. It keeps hopping from one side to another, which I'll indicate in the next slide. Please. So I already told you, and this is a qualitative picture of how the sp2 orbitals, this is uh, sp2. Why it is sp2? Because there's only one, one two s electron and two 2p electrons, they hybridize and they form this butterfly shown on the left and on the right, you have the unhybridized p orbital, which is normal to the xy plane in which the three sp2 orbits orbits or hybrids lie. Next. So this is in fact how you teach your undergrad students about quantum superposition principle, because after all, the fact that we have uh, orbitals we have a butterfly is because of the extended nature of the wave function. And the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics is a linear equation. And therefore, you have quantum superposition principle. So therefore, these three hybridized orbitals are constructed out of a linear, com out of linear combinations, three linear combinations of the 2s and the 2py and the 2px orbitals or eigenstates as they are shown in, the, in this view graph. This is a mathematical way of introducing in the context of graphene, the superposition principle of quantum mechanics that we normally do in our first course on quantum mechanics. Now in the bottom, you can see that you ask the question, what will happen if we bring two carbon atoms together? That is, you're trying to form a solid. Then one carbon atom, will hold the hand of the other carbon atom, which means that they're going to share this sp2 hybridized orbitals. And that is what schematically is shown in the figure at the bottom. Next slide, Aniket, please. All right, so now you have a lattice. And I hope you can see the color code that I have used in the, for the honeycomb lattice. You have green lattice, and you have pink lattice. The green lattice and the pink lattice, each is constructed out of equilateral triangles. Therefore, as I said before, they reflect the symmetry, 120 degree symmetry of the butterfly of the SP, S2 hybridized orbitals. And, and then you can have actually two such possibilities because you have to form a Bravais lattice and therefore, you have the possibilities of a pink lattice and a green lattice giving rise to what is called a honeycomb uh, lattice. It's a textbook quantum mechanics problem because you remember in solid state physics, uh, the first one of the first things we do is what is called a tight binding model, which is to say that you have the nuclei at the lattice size, which are much heavier, but the electron, uh, which is much lighter, and it's uh, weakly localized. Uh, lo weak localization may happen due to some disorder or something else, or some phone 
turns, etc. And it's weakly localized in the sense that it keeps hopping from one localized site to another localized site. And that is our picture of a tight binding model. So here we're going to incorporate the tight binding model on this honeycomb that is. Remember why we had this lone PZ electron, which will keep hopping from one green side to its nearest neighbor side. That's the assumption that we'll make. We'll ignore non-nearest neighbor hopping for the time being. And so the nearest neighbor sites a green lattice site will have a pink lattice site, the pink lattice site will have a green lattice site, and so on and so forth. So that is how the honeycomb lattice is formed. And now we are going to write down a tight, simplest tight binding Hamiltonian for this system in the next slide. Well, before I do that, I already have a picture, but, uh, but maybe we'll come back to this picture uh, just next, later on after the next slide, please. Yeah. So remember what we said that we have a pink lattice. Let me call it A sub lattice, which is the subscript A that is indicated on the left hand side. And you have then the ith side of the A sub lattice, which is the pink lattice, let's say. And the B lattice is the green lattice. Now, in the real space, what is indicated is that whether you can have an electron at the ith side of the A lattice, and if that electron is there, then you represent it by a pseudo spin, a Pauli pseudo spin. It's a fake spin. It's not the real spin, but you say it's up or plus, which is a normal way of introducing pseudo spins to our quantum mechanics students. Similarly, if the electron is not there, then we have a vacancy and that you indicate by minus, which is a spin down, and that is the bottom one. Now from the real lattice, we would like to go to the momentum space by making a discrete Fourier transformation. And that's what is indicated on the right-hand side. You have a summation over the wave vector K and Ri and Rj's are the lattice vectors at the ith and the jth sides respectively for the A and B lattice. So they are connected by the nearest neighbor vector because we are allowing only nearest neighbor jumps in, in our tight binding description. So it is this these states that you use to form your tight binding Hamiltonian, which I think is indicated in the next slide, please. Well, it isn't, sorry, it's not there. So let's go back then, Aniket. Yeah, so what you do is you have a ket vector on the, on the i -h side, and then you bring in a bra vector to form a projection operator, which will then be used as your fundamental building block of a tight binding Hamiltonian, where then in, we have, a, it's prefixed by an energy term, which you can take for simplicity to be just a constant, call it T or something, which is like a tunneling term because it gives you the, if you divide by the Planck constant, it gives you the tunneling frequency for going from one side to the other. Now you take this Hamiltonian in the tight binding picture in the real space, and then you, as I indicated earlier, you go to the Fourier space and you therefore write in the reciprocal space, the, Hamilton, the energy eigenvalue. And then that is how you get the band structure. It's a very simple situation. You have the blue shaded region at the bottom, which will give you the valence band and the grayish, greenish shaded region on the top, which will give you the conduction band. And remember, we had one lone pi electron we could have had two because the Pauli principle would allow two, but it is only half occupied. And that half occupation is reflected into this many body uh, situation where you have the band structure because you then have half filled band situation. The valence band is completely filled and the conduction band is empty. However, of course, you have to move from the valence to the conduction band for all transport, heat capacity, et cetera, resistivity, et cetera, properties. And so you behold on the right-hand side, 
the valence band, which is shown like a cone. I'll tell you why it is a cone. Uh, it goes and touches the up the upper conduction band at a point which is called a Dirac point, and why it is called a Dirac point will be explained later on. Now, it turns out that there are actually six such Dirac points, but only two are inequivalent. We call them K and K prime points. They're not very visible in the figure in the below, but so we will focus on only these two points. And actually that is how the four by four Dirac equation is written. You have pseudo spin two values and the K and the K prime points giving rise to four possibilities. Anyway, so uh, next slide. No, okay, uh, just go back, please, Aniket. One more slide and I'll just say a few words. Yeah, so therefore, that is how we form the band structure. And now what you do is, remember, again, in first course in solid state physics, you have the Fermi distribution at zero temperature and even at some finite temperature, which is like a step function. Uh, so all the, Fermi levels are filled. You have the filled Fermi sphere in three dimension, but in order to get any kind of solid state properties, transport properties, heat capacity, et cetera, you have to promote some electrons across the Fermi surface, giving rise to what, is, what are called electron hole excitations. So this is exactly what you have to do. You have to promote an electron from the valence band across to the conduction band. And this is facilitated when you come very near the K and the K prime point, because that's where you have zero energy difference between the valence and the conduction band. So what you do is you have a complicated dispersion relation coming out of the Fourier transform Hamiltonian, and that you then linearize and you come near the K and the K prime points. And then you will find very interestingly, the Hamiltonian reduces to a term which is linear in the momentum or linear in the wave vector K. However, because you have two possibilities, two sub lattices, Earlier, we had a pseudo spin, that pseudo spin comes into it, and you have a Hamiltonian which reads like sigma dot k, where sigma is the Pauli spin operator and k is the wave vector operator. So, this linearity that energy goes linear in momentum is reminiscent of special theory of relativity, where energy momentum relationship will give you energy to be linear in momentum, and that is what was incorporated by Dirac. In his, in his theory of quantum mechanics. And so it is this linearity of the wave energy dependence on the wave vector or the momentum, which gives the epithet to graphene as a Dirac solid. Let me remind the audience, which you obviously know already, that it's not that the electrons are moving with the speed of light. In fact, they move with the Fermi velocity, which is of the order of one over 300 of the speed of light. That is, speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, but this Fermi velocity is something like, uh, you divide by 300, so it is like 10 to the six meter per second. So we, that is the Dirac-ness where it is coming in. So let me now go ahead then. Yeah, so, uh, let me say it in words now. So you have this Dirac Hamiltonian, which is given in the first equation, which I have written, rewritten in terms of sigma plus and sigma minus, the spin flip operators, and also the angle chi k, which is the angle between the k vector and the x axis in the x y plane. Remember, we said that every all the action is in the x y plane where therefore the vector k is two dimensional and it makes an angle chi k with the x-axis. So that is your first step. Let me, before I go to equation two, let me also tell you, what is your system of interest? So your system of interest is governed by a subsystem Hamiltonian, which is given in equation one, but this subsystem Hamiltonian is in the interaction 
constant always with a surrounding heat bath. A surrounding bath consists of phonons and other electrons. They will bring, they will actually, they're always constantly interacting with the subsystem Hamiltonian. But in thermal equilibrium, we don't have to worry about the bath as we learn in Gibson substitute mechanics, and we only deal with the ages. However, that equilibrium is now disturbed. It is disturbed by the experimental mechanism of applying a frequency dependent electric field. That electric field will create non-equilibrium effects because that electric field couples to, remember the energy due to the electric field is a position operator times the electric field. The position operator does not commute with K, which after all is the moment of P divided by H bar. So therefore there will be energy exchange between your applied electric field and the subsystem of interest, which is HS given by equation one. Where does this energy go to? That energy is dumped into the path. And therefore you need to bring in explicitly the coupling between HS and the path. And you also have to model the path, which we will do later on. So therefore, this is the physics we are going to study. We have it to begin with, we have a system in thermal equilibrium governed by a subsystem Hamiltonian in equation one. We disturb this subsystem very strongly. I say strongly because the electric field that we apply can be arbitrarily large. And therefore, we will not, we're not looking at what we normally do into something called the linear response theory or Kubo response. We will have to treat arbitrary large values of the electric field. So that electric field then disturbs the equilibrium. And as you know, the electric field will introduce a current density, which is given in equation number two. The current density is the number density times the charge E times the velocity. The velocity is dx dt, and that you construct from the Hamil from the Heisenberg equation of motion with for the Hamiltonian given in equation one. So you need a commutator of the momentum variable with x, and that is all well known in the in undergraduate uh, quantum mechanics. But interesting part is that you see, we have a sigma dot k. So it's sigma x k x and sigma y k y. Now dx dt, therefore, will give you the commutator between x and px, and hence you will couple to sigma x. So the, in this problem, unlike many transport problems, which you deal with Boltzmann kinetic transport equations, where you look at velocity changes. Uh, here, the current density directly couples to the X component of the spin, the pseudo spin, and that is what is indicated in equation number two. Now, to, in order to then calculate Jx of t or its macroscopic thermal average, we have to do a quantum statistical mechanical averaging of these quantities. And therefore, for that, we need the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the subsystem Hamiltonian given in equation one. And they are written by the ket vectors alpha k and vk. I have dropped the k index from chi inside the column vectors for simplicity of notation. So remember chi k was the angle between the k vector in the xy plane with the x-axis. So these alpha k and the vk are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in one. Now, therefore, we are transiting from one description of a pseudo spin, which we introduced earlier for electron and vacancy in a sub lattice. But now we have in the momentum space, a possibility of an electron belonging to the valence band, which is indicated by the by the term V or by the index V on the right hand side of uh, equation three. And uh, we also have a conduction band possibilities. So again, we have a two state problem in the case space now, however, given by this eigenstates in equation number three. Uh, next slide. All right, so 
You see, remember I said that Jx of t is given by the Heisenberg time evolution of sigma x. Now, how do you write sigma x of t or its average? In quantum statistical mechanics, we do it in the Schrodinger picture by writing it as trace of the density operator at time t with sigma x at time t equal to zero, as opposed to the Heisenberg picture where you write, directly write down the Heisenberg time evolution. So we'll adopt the Schrodinger picture where we will look at the dynamics in terms of the density matrix or density operator. The one more step, we have sigma x of t. So sigma x, what you do is you sandwich sigma x into the state vector c and the v that I introduced in the last slide in terms of closure property. And then you can rewrite your current density in terms of two operators, which are convenient to write in this form, which I will explain why. Uh, we have a pi k operator, which is given by equation five. And we Sorry. have a... Yeah. Uh, so the C is the same as alpha, the one that you introduced before? Yeah, yeah, C is alpha. I'm sorry, yes, uh, it should have been alpha. I agree with you, yeah. Okay, Absolutely. thanks. So C for conduction and V for valence. Yes, so you have, you've got a pi k operator and a y k operator. So the reason we call them pi k and y k, if you look at the structure of pi k operator, you have a projection operator for the CK state and minus the projection operator for the valence state. This is very similar to how you write uh, the operator sigma z in quantum mechanics. So if you think of your valence and the conduction levels to be like a two level system where these are the representations of the eigenstates of a sigma z operator, then uh, depopulation would imply you have transitioned from one level to the other, from the excited to the ground, or in this case, from the conduction to the valence or from the valence to the conduction. This is called interband transition. And so that is like, that would depopulate the levels. This phrase is coined from literature and nuclear magnetic resonance, where you have a depopulation phenomenon of transition from one level to the other. And then the other operator is similar to the sigma y operator in quantum mechanics, and it's called dephasing operator. What it does is that, you know, this operator does not actually cause transition between the levels, but can change the wave functions of the excited and the ground state causing dephasing. And so the nomenclature that we adopted from nuclear magnetic resonance literature is that the first one is depopulation and the other one is dephasing. Later on, the first term in yk, which is minus i ck ket vector vk bra, is something we'll call yk plus and is Hermitian adjoint is the next term we'll call yk minus later on. So in this representation, or in terms of the depopulation operator, the subsystem operator is diagonal in the depopulation operator space, just as we diagonalize in the NMR, the Zeeman Hamiltonian in terms of IZ or sigma Z, which is represented in equation number seven. So HS or subsystem Hamiltonian is entirely given in terms of the depopulation operator pi k with the prefactor, which is a Fermi velocity VF times the mod of k. That actually gives you a kind of a frequency, delta k we'll call it, because later on when we look at interband transitions between the conduction and the valence band, that will be our characteristic frequency for the subsystem. Now, we would like to talk about dissipation because after all, you applied an electric field and you're look, going to look at transport phenomena. Hello. <laughs>
Hello. Yeah, we got disconnected for the time being. We're back again. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So you see, there are two kinds of physics now. Remember, we, we already indicated we have depopulation, which means that you can depopulate the upper level or the ground level. And so you need a term which will cause these transitions. And this is the next second term, which is YKXP, because YK is off diagonal in the representation in which pi k is diagonal. So that normally is induced as in the case of magnetic resonance we know, it's called spin lattice relaxation induced by phonons. So the phonon operators are indicated by XP operator on the second line of equation number nine. And so you uh, write them in terms of second quantized notation of bosonized operators, AQ and AQ dagger with a coupling constant GQ. Then we also have another term, which is the dephasing term. The dephasing term is pi k. Pi k commutes with the subsystem Hamiltonian. So it gives you dissipationless decoherence. Uh, you, since Professor Aroni is in the audience, we use such an idea even in the context of qubit relaxation, where we talked about dissipationless decoherence. So that's the term pi k x e. Why does x have a subscript e? Because the bath also consists not just of phonons, but electron hole excitations. These electron hole excitations are in pairs, are like bosonized form. You can do Swinger bosonized form of these electron hole excitations. And you can write them in terms of the bosonized operators BQ and BQ dagger, which is indicated in the first term in the operator XE. And, there, and then those have a different coupling constant GQ. And the, the bath is usually a free bosonic character. So you have the free bosonic Hamiltonian, uh, a bunch of quantum harmonic oscillators, uh, in second quantized form in equation number 10. So here is the physics. You have a subsystem Hamiltonian HS, which is directly proportional to pi k, the deep population operator. That subsystem Hamiltonian is put in contact with a phonon and an electronic bath. The phonon bath causes transitions between the eigenstates of subsystem Hamiltonian or pi k causing depopulation induced by a bath which is external to the system. And it also, the bath also has another term which comes from the electronic excitations which actually will deface the wave functions and that does not cause any energy exchange, but yet can cause decoherence. And so that is indicated by the other term. The, the, the other term, in fact, is used in a bosonized form. And it is well known in the literature that if you use uh, for a spectral function, which is a property of the heat bath excitations for the electronic bath, which is called an ohmic bath, where the spectral function is linear in frequency. That was a very old paper by Chang and Chakravarti, Sudeep Chakravarti, that is in 1985 PRL, where they showed that you can actually treat them in terms of the spin boson Hamiltonian, the electron hole excitations in terms of bosonized operators through the ohmic dissipation model. We'll introduce the ohmic dissipation later on, but let's now Proceed. So let, before proceeding, so what is at hand? And now comes with technicality. Your starting point is a quantum Liouville equation for the density operator. D rho dt is minus i commutator of the full Hamiltonian of the system with rho of t. The full Hamiltonian has four parts. You have the subsystem Hamiltonian, which is already there in the pristine graphene. You now also have a coupling term to the bath, which we'll call V, the operator V, which will indicate already indicated in equation eight. 
you have the HB part, which is the bath part indicated by equation 10. And the fourth term comes from your experimental means of coupling the electric field term to the system. Now the electric field is an oscillatory time dependent field. It's a complicated way of complicated scenario. But what you do is again, very reminiscent of quantum optics, where you use what is called a rotating wave approximation. Remember the characteristic frequency is the frequency of tunneling between the conduction and the valence band. You're now bringing in externally another frequency omega of the external electric field. You look only at, yes, equation number two. You only look at terms which are resonant with this characteristic frequency and ignore all the other non-resonant terms which rapidly fluctuate with time because after all, you'll be looking at the steady state response in the limit of t going to infinity where such terms will oscillate out to zero. Okay, one more technical point. Remember, we had an electric field which we coupled to the X operator, the position operator. Now, how, how is this coupling term coming from? Remember that you have sigma dot k, which is essentially sigma dot p. Now, when you have, whenever you have an electromagnetic field, your p has undergoes a gauge transformation. P becomes P minus Ea over C, minus sign depending on the convention you use for the charge of the electron. So A is a vector potential. There is no magnetic field here, but the electric field is a time dependent magnetic field. So that if I have a time dependent magnetic field, then the vector potential is also time dependent, dA dt. And dA dt is in fact the electric field, the time dependent. So if the electric field is like E cosine omega t, your vector potential has to be an integral of that and that will give you sine omega t over omega, which is given in equation 12. Very interesting because you automatically get in your external Hamiltonian H omega of t, a term which is the ratio of the amplitude of the electric field divided by the frequency omega, multiplied by the Fermi velocity times the wave vector. So this characteristic energy term is going to be very important in fact, it's related to what Mischenko in a 2011 FISREV letter in the context of nonlinear optical conductivity of graphene called the uh, introduced this parameter, we'll call a Mischenko parameter, which we'll define later on. So this is your fourth term, H omega of T. So you have four different terms constituting the total Hamiltonian is an explicitly time dependent Hamiltonian even the Schrodinger picture, in. And so what you do is now you go, as you do in quantum mechanics, go to the interaction picture. Here the interaction picture is defined by HS and HB, which commute with each other, subsystem Hamiltonian with Bath Hamiltonian. Neither of them commutes with V, of course, because that's how the energy exchange takes place. Incidentally, H omega also commutes with HB, but H omega has to be treated separately because we have to look at nonlinear response. So we go to the interaction picture where the interaction picture time evolution operator is given by exponential of minus I HS plus H, HB of T. And so therefore, equation number 14 is the Liouville equation that is your starting point. And equation number 15, is now the interaction picture repre representation of the Liouville equation, where rho prime is the interaction picture form of the density operator in the Schrodinger picture. So that has therefore, uh, interestingly, a term which is actually coming from the effective indicated by the superscript E double F H omega, which is the coupling between the oscillatory field and the system of interest. And that's the commutator term. Normally we don't consider it a non-equilibrium stat meg because we have a subsystem Hamiltonian, a coupling term and a bath term and we proceed. But here we have to treat this term on its merit 
because we have to go into the nonlinear regime. Normally in Kubo theory, remember that you write the response in terms of Kubo correlations in the absence of the electric field. And so the electric field term doesn't appear, but here the electric field has to appear because of the nonlinearity. So that's indicated in equation 15. What's the last term? That last term is where all the spices are. Last term is the one which is the relaxational term. And that, I mean, I'll now say in words, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. What you do is you uh, go to the interaction picture, write the density operator in an exponentiated form. It's convenient to introduce what are called Liouville operators as a technicality because you have to do an averaging over the bar because you're looking at an average density operator. When you do the averaging, you do what is called a cumulant expansion and you stop at the second order term because you treat the interaction V to be something like a weak perturbation. Uh, and so then you get the cumulant and the first term will give you actually the commutator term and the other term is what is given in equation 16 where I have also indicated the, the in equation 16, the uh, interaction picture representation of the Schrodinger density of state for the subsystem alone now, uh, indicated by the subscript S. So that already subsumes an averaging over the bar. So look at the structure of equation 16. It has got a structure of a double commutator. Normally, it's uh, some, some people call it uh, the Lindblad form. The Lindblad makes this another assumption, which I'll indicate later. It's also familiar in, in the context of block red field equations in magnetic resonance. So you have a double commutator structure. You have, a, you have averaged out over the bath indicated by the trace over this bath, uh, trace subscript B, and what appears inside the trace operation are VI of tau, that is the interaction picture representation of the coupling term V. That is VI of tau will be exponential I, IHS plus HB tau, VI of zero exponential minus IHS plus HB tau, et cetera, et cetera. So it is this relaxational term that you massage and you ultimately go to your writing the average current density operator. Next slide, please. So you end up therefore with equations of motion for separately for the depopulation operator pi k of t average and also the one of the constituents of the dephasing operator y k plus. Remember we split the y k into y k plus and its Hermitian adjoint y k minus. So y k minus is just obtained from equation 10 by its Hermitian conjugate. What appears are actually two red constants. One is gamma p, this called is because it's phonon induced or like spin lattice relaxation, is the rate of spin lattice relaxation, which is a cosine transform of a spectral correlation function of the bath operators of the phonon part. And the cosine function oscillates with delta k, which is the characteristic transition frequency between the conduction band and the valence band. And you have similarly equation 20, where you have the gamma E, which is caused by the electronic relaxation. Remember, that's the dephasing term. And that also has a different spectral function, which will be indicated by psi E of tau in the next slide. So here are, now I have done one assumption. Remember, your relaxational term as an integral from zero to t. So even transient effects can be talked about. That is short time effects. However, more your, you, one mostly looks at the long time response. So when are the transient effects important? See, you have a quantum mechanical system. A quantum mechanical system, when you introduce dissipation, generally would have non-Markovian effects. These non-Markovian effects are most pronounced on very short time scales, which are determined by h bar divided by kBt. 
So at very low temperature, these time scales could be long and therefore not Markovian effects may be important. However, we normally don't consider the non-Markovian effects. In the steady state response, we look at the Markovian regime. And so in the relaxational Lindblad type equation, we replace the upper limit of the integral zero to t by t equal to infinity. But let me remind the audience, and we actually did look into the effects of this transient terms uh, from non-Markovian to Markovian effects by relaxing that condition. But at the moment, I'm only showing you the Markovian lean blood type problems, where now just look at equation 22 and equation 24. Uh, you have, sorry, actually you just simply look at equation 24 and equation 25. You have the gamma E, which is the spin-spin relaxation, borrowing the language of NMR induced by the electrons. So that has a spectral function of electrons indicated by J of omega, the cotangent hyperbolic beta omega by two, there's a Planck cancel inside, which comes from the bosonic nature, as you all know uh, from the Bose statistics. And then there's the last term is the phononic rate, which is a spin lattice rate given by equation 25. Okay. Susanta. Uh, it seems, uh, can you go back to this slide? Yes. yes. There is a T dependence in equation 22, for example. Th that yeah. Is that so, T supposed to be tau or, or does gamma depend on time or what? Yes, gamma will depend on time normally for the in the non-Markovian regime, Amnon. So if you look at transient response, then the... the you, it's not correct to call them rate constants. The, the, the equations would have non-Markovian terms. Think in terms of rate equations where the rate themselves or rates themselves have time dependence. Only when you go, when we th you think of the fluctuations which correlation times are shorter of the path than the system times of interest, then you extend the time limit t to infinity, which will, so will indicate does that time dependence look like. I'll show you. Yes. Aniket. So very nice question that uh, Professor Aharoni asked. So here is the time dependent rate, which is given in equation 26, induced by the, the electronic effects. And that is why in equation 27, we use the ohmic model for spectral function. Ohmic model is linear in omega to begin with, but the bath also has a characteristic cutoff frequency, which we indicate by an exponential cutoff. The cutoff frequency is omega CE. So to answer Professor Aharoni's question, now you try, you do a full calculation of this, numerically, of course, and you plot the dimensionless gamma e on the ordinate on the left hand side of this figure times a, a dimensionless quantity which is a cutoff frequency times t so again in non equilibrium dissipative statistical mechanics people usually take the cutoff to be very large but here we want to look at the cutoff dependence as well as the time depends on the rates as professor aroni asked me so what you do is you look at two distinct temperatures, let's say. T is 300 Kelvin, the solid line on the left-hand side, which is like room temperature. Then you go to very low temperature. Now, you see what happens is, let me indicate that already in equation 26. If you let time T go to infinity, then the only time inside time dependence is cosine omega of tau. As you all know that if you integrate zero to infinity cosine omega of T, it's roughly like a delta function in omega. So therefore, you get a constant. So then you'll get a time independent constants indicated by the saturated values of the gamma E uh, at long times when omega C T is very large. So this is this shows numerically how at two different temperatures, the saturation values would be different because of the cotangent hyperbolic factor. At short times, however, what happens is at short times when T is small, 
tau is also necessarily small because tau is limited by the integral from zero to t. So you make an expansion of cosine omega tau and to the lowest order, it's like one. And so uh, the whole thing is proportional to t. So gamma e prime therefore shoots from the value zero linearly as a function of t and eventually then saturates. A very interesting phenomenon that you see that as you go to lower and lower temperature, gamma e first increases and then decreases. So it's not monotonic, unlike room temperature behavior. So that is what we do. Now, what do we use? What do we get for the saturation values for gamma e? And these results match with the experimental measurements given in Nature Nanotechnology uh, in this paper. Well, unfortunately, the year is not mentioned. Uh, it's 2015 or 16, I think. So the gamma E is actually in, in terahertz regime. It's like 10 to the 14 hertz at 300 K and, and three at 30 K is like 10 to the 13 hertz. And that temperature dependence is shown on the right hand side. So gamma E is actually the faster rate than the spin lattice relaxation rate. And that is what is shown here. We now focus on the gamma P. Next slide. So gamma p, for gamma p, you have to use a different kind of spectral function for the phonon bath. If you're dealing with acoustic phonons, then you have the prefactor which goes like omega cube. Again, you use an exponential cutoff. Could have also used another cutoff called the Drude cutoff, but we'll use, we use that. And here are the values of gamma p in the boxed equation. is 10 to the 12, two orders of magnitude smaller in rate than the spin, uh, spin-spin relaxation induced by the electrons and at two different temperatures are given. And again, you have the same phenomenon of first and the non-monotomic behavior of the gamma rate as a function of the dimensionless time multiplied by the, the bath. And here I have actually noted down what values we have used for the cutoff frequency for the gamma P plots uh, for the gamma E plot, we have a cutoff frequency which you use as 10 to the 14 hertz. And for the gamma P, P plot, we have used the cutoff frequency which is five times 10 to the 12 hertz. And then you also have the, uh, the factors alphas prefixing the spectral function, which we have taken respectively for the electronic case as 0.2 and for the phononic case as lower value of 0.06. So to summarize, and I'm very happy that was Aruni asked this question, that transient effects also can be discussed within the formulation. And that is what I have indicated. I think my time is getting up and I now go and summarize what I said and I'll then take questions. Aniket? Well, uh, yeah, this is roughly, uh, remember, we're we are interested in nonlinear regime. Here is the Mischenko parameter. The Mischenko parameter is in the boxed equation, which is called eta. It's a charge times the amplitude of the electric field times the Fermi velocity divided by the Planck constant times the frequency of the applied field times the geometric mean of gamma E and gamma P. Mischenko didn't talk about it. He had only one rate because he was doing rate theory in the uh, not in terms of density operator, but in terms of the wave function. So here is the Mischenko parameter. And that parameter characterizes the nonlinear regime. So if you look at the left-hand side, where the nonlinear ND is why we call it nonlinear dirty limit. Dirty is an euphemism, but the rates are very large. And we have the nonlinear regime where eta parameter is larger than one. Then the Kubo regime would be the, the C regime where eta is rather small compared to one. And, and, and so that is the C stands for clean and it is the linear regime, linear Kubo regime. So you have a transition from the linear Kubo to linear dirty, which is rate constants increasing. And then you go across the dashed line going beyond the eta equal to one line, and that then you would enter the nonlinear regime, which is our focus of interest here. Uh, last slide, please. 
So anyway, uh, this is very quickly, I mean, uh, most of the quantum mechanical concepts we used earlier are there in the high school physics plus, we call it plus two syllabus in a scattered way, ideas and orbitals, bonding, Schrodinger equation, electron spin, they find places in quantum chemistry, rudimentary notions of special relativity in physics, matrices appear in mathematical physics, bringing all these themes together in the context of graphene has been our idea. Finally, Dr. We stressed that calling graphene a Dirac solid is metaphorical. The actual electrons in graphene neither have zero mass, nor do they travel with the speed of light, they travel with the Fermi velocity. What is amazing is that certain predictions of relativistic quantum mechanics, which have so far eluded experimental verification, can now find justification in the down-to-earth laboratory of graphene. And now my absolute last slide, Anike. This is the more technical part. What we have done is to write down a master equation for the reduced density operator that was reviewed earlier in a book. There, and there are many other books which have reviewed these things. Uh, the oscillatory applied electric field interaction was treated in the rotating wave approximation familiar in quantum optics in which off resonant terms are ignored. That is off resonance with the valence to conduction band transitions or tunneling. The heat path is treated in the ohmic dissipation model uh, for uh, electronic excitations and for the phononic models, we used a separate uh, density spectral function. In the Markov approximation of the master equation, contact may be, can be made with phenomenological rate theory. However, we can also look at transition phenomena that was triggered by a question that was Aharoni asked. Finally, the nonlinear response is important in graphene in the regime where this Mischenko parameter, which where I have introduced a capital W, which is the square root of gamma E times gamma P, is this parameter is much larger than unity. Here V is the Fermi velocity, omega the applied frequency, and W is roughly the bandwidth associated with the transition from the valence to the conduction pipe. My time is up. And I stop here. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. The floor is now open for questions. Okay. So, thank you for the nice talk. So uh, I was wondering, is it possible to systematically uh, think about the first order and second order or higher order? responses in this formulation? Yes, indeed. In fact, if you kindly read our papers, the answer is there. Okay. There's also a, a, another paper, uh, a, a collabor international collaboration with IIT Kanpur group of Amit Agarwal and in 2016. They don't use the uh, full uh, spin boson type Hamiltonians, where we can actually give the temperature dependence of the rates as well. They introduce them as phenomenological parameters, but they also answer this particular question that you have asked. Uh, this is the 2000 FISREB B paper, which is referenced in uh, my 2021 FISREB B paper. Uh, but here we go beyond the Agarwal et al. paper in terms of bringing in the modern uh, contemporary language of an uh, open quantum system with a subsystem linked with the Bath Hamiltonian. Yeah. Hey. Maybe I have a question. Yes. It's a very general one. At the very beginning, you uh, explained how uh, the graphene lattice um, structure emerges from the uh, quantum chemical study of the um, uh, different uh, electrons in the, in the atom. Yes, can you, can, you, can you go to that slide that Professor yes, is referring to? Just, uh, I was just wondering, uh, I never uh, dealt with these uh, details. So uh, no, you have the- Go below, have go the, below I think, that's where he is asking. No, 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 no. the previous okay. one, I think. Yes, yes, that's the one. 
So, so there's this degeneracy of these uh, 2s and 2p uh, electrons, and then you have some fine structure uh, which emerges, and uh, you get the 120 degrees. This is all for a single atom. Now you bring these atoms together, and what we know, what I at least thought I know, is that uh, graphene is uh, quite a, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the atoms are quite strongly uh, uh, interacting or hold up to each other in a very strong way, meaning there's a strong coupling between them. So is it somehow obvious that uh, this picture is not kind of destroyed, actually, by the, by the mere interaction between Well, the it's, it's actually modified. What you, you raised a very important question. You know, fine structure comes from spin-orbit interaction. Uh, so, which is uh, something that, again, we learn in the electromagnetic theory uh, in the undergraduate college. So it comes from sigma dot L term, uh, but it is, people have considered the spin orbit effect. Uh, let me also say, because uh, since you asked this question and Professor Aruni is here, you know, uh, the spin orbit interaction gives rise to what is called a Rushba interaction also. And the Rushba effect is kind of reminiscent of the Dirac Hamiltonian in the case of graphene. Uh, you, you have here sigma dot k, which is sigma x k x plus sigma y k y. But for usual Rushba type, not the Dressel house type, you know, the spin orbit interaction gives you sigma x py minus sigma ypx kind of term. So that is a new kind of physics. We have not treated the spin orbit interaction at all. What the effect of spin orbit interaction would be on top of all that I have discussed here is something actually we're looking at now. Thank you. In, in the pure graphene, uh, spin orbit is relatively weak. It becomes much stronger in, in uh, uh, when the plane is is not straight, when you you involve the p z state together with the p x and p y, so for, for, for normal, normal planar graphene, I don't think spin orbit is very strong. Yes. So what Professor Aharoni just now said that you may have, see we, we have considered gapless interactions. And so if you, you can also have gapped graphene where you have to bring in the sigma z term into reckoning and, and then physics changes. But for the situation that we consider the spin orbit interaction effect is not very large. And as indicated already, if you have gapped graphene, if you also put in a perpendicular magnetic field, then you also have the Landau phenomenon coming in the Landau diamagnetism. Remember, we are only talking about paramagnetic effects now. There is no diamagnetic effect. The diamagnetic effect will come into reckoning when you have an external magnetic field as well. And that is a complicated mess, uh, but very interesting to look at. The combination of Landau physics with Rashba spin orbit interaction with the kind of graphene physics that we have talked about here is something that uh, we hope to work on. I, I thought Sergey was asking about the electron-electron interactions. Ah, ah, you. I was just wondering if there is, okay, there is this fine structure here and there are some energy scales involved and then you bring two atoms together, just two, and there's some uh, effective uh, interaction energy between these two atoms. So I thought since they are so tightly connected into this graphene structure that maybe this energy is much bigger than scale than the, the scale of this uh, fine structure uh, picture we see here. And therefore the fine structure picture becomes kind of irrelevant, but apparently it doesn't. And so I, I was just wondering uh, how I can make uh, ends meet here. I don't have an answer to this question. Uh, clearly we have ignored the many body effects of electron-electron interactions here. What that will do in terms of exchange forces, etc., is something that maybe Hamnon has an insight into. Okay, so if there aren't uh, any more questions, let us thank 
Professor Dr. Gupta once more for this nice pedagogical talk. I would like to thank you once again, uh, Aniket and your entire PCS group uh, for having me here. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, it is over Zoom, but uh, and I'm missing uh, Professor Aruni and Professor Orion in Olman by just about a fortnight. Uh, hopefully, at some point in the future, uh, our paths will cross near Seoul. And uh, so we can do some soul searching uh, together uh, when we meet. And it's so nice, however, to see Professor Aroni, who told me he was vacationing in somewhere north of Israel. Uh, and so it's good that he could join. And thank you all of us, all of you for joining uh, in this afternoon. Thank you so much. Do, do come to Dijon when we are there.